Thank you for auditing the always positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's kind of scared to review the album Jazz Codes by More Mother. I'll tell you why I'm scared. I'll tell you why it's taken me almost a month now, maybe even more, to review this very interesting, very engaging album. I mean, I've probably got as many requests to review this album as I have any other album. I just reviewed NBA Youngboy, <laughs> and a lot of people are a little bit upset, like, when are you going to get to more Mother? When are you going to get to more Mother? Well, let me sort of tell you the, the blocks that, that occurred to me as to why I didn't review this album yet, because I think it says something about the strength of the album itself, and about the weakness of myself, and maybe you, okay? First of all, it has nothing to do with anything, but my grandmother's name, uh, like, she was just called Mother Moore. Like, that's how I knew her. That was her last name, was Moore. So it's very weird having this, this Moore, Mother, Mother, Moore thing. But that's not too much. The main issue is this. You know, like, I don't have a problem reviewing things that people perceive of as being too stupid. As a matter of fact, I like reviewing things that people conceive of as too stupid because I think I can lend my sort of authority to help sort of shine a light on the fact that no, NBA Youngboy is not stupid. His music is not bad. It is interesting or good in this way. But when it comes to reviewing music that is very smart, music that is sometimes called too smart, it's intimidating because it ends up being like a lesson in humility. This album by More Mother challenged me so much. Uh, there's many intertextual references to things outside of the album, to musicians and figures that I'd never heard of. And it's hard for me. It's hard for me to come on here and sort of say, I've never heard of this person, because then I look this person up and I'm like, oh my God, they did this, they did that, they did this, they did that. How did I not know this? I am an educated person, but educated people need humility. <laughs> and that's part of what makes this album so interesting, is that, okay, of course, I know Cab Calloway. He was born in Rochester, where I live. And of course, I know Miles Davis, and I've been trying to figure out Bitches Brew for the last couple years. You know, like, it's not like I don't know anything about jazz. But that leads to the sort of third roadblock, which is the intersection of hip-hop and jazz. I've always found this to be a very troubling intersection. So, you know, in the, in the early days of hip-hop, you know, it was mostly dominated, you know, either sort of by disco or by sort of like proto-electronic music. But then as time sort of developed, it became clear that the three main soundscapes of hip-hop, at least in the old school leading into the new school, would be three four-letter words. Four-letter words that illustrate human greatness in the form of African-American cultural creation. Soul, funk, and jazz. I'm arrogant enough to feel like I understand funk music. I'm arrogant enough to feel like I understand soul music. But I've always had a very difficult time feeling as though I understand jazz. And if you stay tuned to the end of the video, I'll tell you a little bit of my history with that actual word. But in terms of hip-hop, it's always felt too shallow. And I'm going to sound like an old man here. I'm gonna sound like a, I'm gonna sound like some guy from the 80s who thinks this new hip hop music is just a passing phase. The thing about sampling, and I love sampling, and it's great, and it's recontextualization, and it's recreation, and it's its own thing, but it does have a flattening quality. So if you hear a James Brown funk, you know, the funky drummer drum loop by Clyde Stubblefield, you know, you hear that that drum loop, and it's great, and it's funky, and it's awesome, and it's been played in hundreds and hundreds of songs but it doesn't have the same funk as when you actually listen to the song Funky Drummer. Like the feeling when it leads into that break and the rest of the song and the groove that Stubblefield is in and just the syncopation that he's in, that sample, that, that, that I, I did that very poorly, but that drum, the most important drum loop, it's flattened. Same thing with soul music. A cool sample, it gets flattened. And when that happens with something like jazz, a music that is as complicated, as intricate, as nuanced, as challenging as jazz, I find that flattening almost unlistenable. So there was a real phase in the 80s and early 90s and, and longer in other countries where it seemed that jazz might actually take off as the basis of hip hop or sort of like the primary influence. You know, in America, there was a gigantic hit by, uh, by a, a band called Diggable Planets. Now, this hit is actually referenced on the More Mother album. Cool like that. I remember seeing the video on MTV. 
I remember, I remember just seeing how cool it was and it felt like jazz and they kept saying jazz and they kept on saying how cool jazz was and it's just based on this sick bass line. But looking back at it now, it's so surface level. It's like, it's jazz in the way that saying the word jazz elicits a certain feeling in people without having that depth. Because I study French hip hop a lot as part of my job and part of my interest in the French culture, um, in, the, in the early days, it, it, there really there were two poles. There was the hardcore, which was hardcore in France, which meant they still were like against guns and crime, but the, the soundscape was a little bit more harsh and they swore. And then there was jazzy, le hardcore, le jazzy, dominated by figures like MC Solar or Sage Poet de la Rue. And there, it was maybe a little bit more developed, you know, sort of in the same way that I would say, um, you know, Gangstar did a better job of developing hip hop and jazz uh, crossover than maybe a group like Digable Planets did. But like, it really felt like here we were going to, like, like this might actually be the dominant sound of hip hop. And I never really went for it. I never really went for the jazz cool because it felt superficial to me. And in, in, in the end, it made me not like that kind of hip hop and it made me like jazz less. This is all a big preamble to explain to you why Jazz Codes by More Mother is a very successful jazz rap album. Like, whatever it was that I thought couldn't happen, or whatever flattening it is that happens when you sample, it is not flattened here. Now listen, obviously, To Pimp a Butterfly is a good example of jazz and rap working together. There it's not flattened. There have been other examples just in the last year. Um, but this album, More Mother Jazz Codes, is so challenging because it's not based on, you know, bebop or swing. It's based on free jazz. Hey, auditors, people who like watching this show, Thank you for forcing me to, to review this. Thank you for being so insistent. And also, damn you, <laughs> this took a lot of work. I had to really think about a lot of things that I just let go, because let me tell you what I know about free jazz. Let me tell you what I knew about free jazz. I knew my friend, Ben, freshman year, my guitar player, I used to play drums, used to be a musician, right? My friend, Ben, told me a hilarious joke. Hey, Sky, yeah? Do you know why they call it free jazz? Mind you, this is the first time I'd ever heard those words put together. Free jazz. Okay. Hey, Scott, you know why they call it free jazz? Why? Because no one would pay for it. Oh, it was funny. It was hilarious. I have repeated that joke tens of times in my life. It's so funny. It's so hilarious. But I didn't know what free jazz was. I, ha I don't know if I'd ever heard it. I don't know if I've heard it since. So what I wanted to do for you is put forth this idea. That More Mother's album is great because it's based on free jazz. And perhaps we could say that it's even creating something which I think we could be so bold to call free rap. Now, I'm not going to force someone into a genre, so if she doesn't want to be known as free rap, that's fine. But I think it works. So what I, did, I tried to find a good definition of free jazz. And by good definition, I mean not just the first one I found on Wikipedia or Collins. I found one by someone named John A. Maurer IV, someone who's taught at Stanford and sort of like a, uh, a, project on, uh, a project on sort of like digital music and jazz. Okay? So th this is, the, this is the, the definition. And see if, if you're a fan of More Mother, if this matches to you. Basically, so-called free jazz is jazz in which free, which is free from the chord changes and functional tonality employed in traditional jazz music, emphasizing in their place other kinds of musical parameters and ideas such as melody, rhythm, timbre, form, and or different uses of harmony. Free jazz is still considered jazz, however, since it is A, primarily an improvisatory, improvisatory music form, and B, usually maintains, however broken and distorted at times, some sense of swing, whether directly or indirectly implied by periodic swells of dynamic level and or texture. Okay, so it's free from the chord changes, free from the repetition, free from the typical time signatures, free from time signatures themselves, but still maintaining some amount of swing, still primarily improvised. 
So what I did, I did a clever little thing, and I slightly altered that to define free rap as it is defined by this album by More Mother, Jazz Codes. Free rap. Sky Payne as adapted from John Maurer. Maurer. <laughs> it's a hard name to say. M-A-U-R-E-R. More, say it in French. Basically, so-called free rap is rap which is free from the repetitive rhythmic beat structure and rhyming lyrics employed in traditional rap music, emphasizing in their place other kinds of rhythmic and lyrical parameters and ideas such as melody, rhythm, timbre, form, and or different uses of harmony. Free rap is still considered rap, however, since it is a primarily an African-American art expressing the material conditions under which it was created, and b usually maintains, however broken and distorted at times, some sense of flow, whether directly accentuated or indirectly implied by periodic swells of dynamic level and or texture. Are you a more mother fan? Does that not describe this album? Oh, smash the like bucket. If you like what I'm doing here, or if you don't. You can smash the unlike bucket. That's fine, too. Um, subscribe. Uh, join my Reddit. I'm on Instagram, all that stuff. Please do that, because I always forget to ask you. Okay? So this is my concept here, that now that I am no longer a smug prick who would laugh at a joke, do you know why they're called free jazz? Because no one would pay for it. No, you 14-year-old <laughs> suburban doofus. They call it free jazz because it is free of these constraints. So let's think about this album, More Mother, Jazz Codes, as being free of the constraints of hip hop. Now, from what I've read, More Mother is usually described as a poet and not even a hip hop artist anyway. Already we're sort of breaking these ideas of what is a rap artist and what is a poet. You can see my, my video on, uh, on Bob's Son by Rap Ferreira where I really kind of go into this question of hip hop artist and poet. But let's get into this album. The thing that I like about free rap and about this album is it does what free jazz also does. And I've spent a lot of time listening to examples of free jazz for this review. Is it creates that most 21st century of words a vibe. It really does. It creates more emotion. It, because it's built up with these little instances, often people improvising uh, at the same time, not necessarily playing the same thing at the same time, it creates this sort of transcendent looseness. And transcendent is a word that really comes up with this album. I'm going to talk about the moment where I listened to it for the third time and I basically had a religious experience. The first time I listened to it was the time it came out. And I'm like, oh, I've heard of More Mother. Uh, she made an album with Billy, Moore, uh, Billy Woods. I, I think I'm, I'm going to listen to this. Mm, I don't get it. Next, I don't get this. Next, I don't get this. Next, only through the insistence of my viewers do I come back to it. Multiple listens reviews its true strength, reveals its true strength, because like you just get into it. You know, like you get to, into a song and you're like, oh, this is that song where the saxophone does that one thing, that one time where it's like, Meh. it's like it's hardly even planned. Meh. Like, oh, this is that one song where that, you know, like, like, like you just get into it. And, and it can become, it can be a vibe. Where, you, where you're just sort of like allowing it to be your background, or it can be a very intentional listening experience with examples of intense musicianship. You know, I live in Rochester, very near the Eastman School of Music, and, and they have a thing called New Music Thursdays or New Music Wednesdays where you go in and you hear people play the most avant-garde music in the world. And, and, uh, and it's insane, because there'll be times where they will like be quiet and they will like play one note like every like seven minutes. But in order to be good enough to do that, you have to be the top of the top of the top to play music like that. To play music that sounds like anybody can do it with any kind of grace <laughs> requires a level of mastery that is found in this album by More Mother. And it's easy to overlook and it's easy to misunderstand. Just like it's easy to go into a museum and see a piece of abstract expressionist painting and say, oh, I could do that. Newsflash, no, you didn't. Okay, so let me get more into the album. I'm going to give you a stamp, an example song. Just click above the plastic banana back there and above the picture of Billie Holiday. I'll get into that later. I'm going to take... It's hard to pick an example song from this album because the whole thing is... It flows really well. It's not like there's one song that does everything, but I think maybe the best example is the song Arms Save featuring Nicole Mitchell, who is a flautist. A flautist is someone who plays the flute, not someone who plays the flout. 
Sorry. That, I didn't write that joke down. I promise you. I don't have a script. I just have notes. That's not on the notes. You can look. I don't say she plays the flout. This is what I'm talking about, these moments, where you get excited listening to this album. Because this is basically like baby making music, you know, we got, you know, Ron Burgundy line playing the flute, ham and eggs, you know, really good flute playing, matched with really good saxophone playing. And then at a certain point, I believe what is a trombone, and just all this noodling, improvising music, and the way that it interacts is not easy to listen to the first time. It's not easy to listen to or understand the second time, but when you sort of transcend that desire to understand and find structure, when you yourself are free from the constraints of finding regularity, of it's 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 uh, transcendent, enlightening. It's I lose the words, like I just did. It's. It's that. That's the feeling that I get. Just absolute joy, incomprehensible, unable to word it to. I cannot word it on. I cannot word, I cannot put the word on the thing, the feeling, the thing. The my job, well my job is I teach French, my hobby is I do this channel, but my channel where I talk about the things that they do, what do I have to describe the emotional feelings that this gives me? The feeling of transcendence and joy of hearing two amazing musicians working together and not together at the same time with these beautiful words going around it? <clears throat> Starting off with just these words, wait a minute, Lord behold us, all this noodling around, like a drum solo, like the drums on this album basically very rarely start. They're usually just kind of like tinkling drum solos random bell percussion. I think there's a trombone solo in here. And then the whole time that she's talking, there's this like voice that gets, it's like this pitched up effect. Like, blah, blah, blah. So like if she says a word like, uh, if she says a word like telephone, she'll say telephone, 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 like that, right? That kind of echoing effect is happening. So like a chipmunk echo. There's a lot of bass going on here. It's basically like basso continuo, meaning like it's just a continual bass line, but it doesn't really do the same thing in the beginning. And then there's this like squealing in the background, which reminds me a lot of sort of like a Yoko Ono scream. Yoko Ono is pretty free. Say what you will about her music. Freedom is a big part of it. And then more of these like background sounds go and these sort of winds. We had this like, this like just trombone and saxophone. And then almost out of nowhere, it settles. It settles into a beat, into like a rap beat. This kind of like languid, re repetitive hip hop drum beat. The bass gets more regular. The saxophone is still going nuts, but then it becomes sort of a standard-ish rap song. Of course, what she's rapping is a repetition of what she said the first, so she spoke it the first time and kind of raps it the second time, but it's not really based on on a regular uh, rhyming or regular meter. And this is the thing with the lyrics. Most lyrics on this album appear to be about African-American music and African-American musicians and their life and the relationship between their music and spirituality, the relationship between their music and history, particularly black history, particular oppression of uh, black militants, a lot of these kind of different themes going on here. And then there is also, I believe, and this is the thing, this is my first time listening to More Mother, okay? So I'm not some expert. I'm not some dude who's telling you what's up. I'm some dude who's telling you what I think is up. All my interpretations of this album are like, I mean, always my interpretations are just my interpretations, but sometimes I'm a little more confident. <laughs> I'm not super confident in my readings. Which is freeing. I understand this song to be a song about a feminist song. That's how I understand this song. To be about ways in which women, in particular African American women, are stuck in a cycle of violence through their partners who themselves are victims of cycles of violence. That's how I read it. So I'm just going to read, this is the only time I'm going to read you all lyrics to a song. Remold from the same cloth, black flag, black flag, black flag, soft throat cut, no, soft throat cost the life of its source, carried a treble like my only sword, I swore it off, 
Lots of great like, playing with the sonorities of sword and swore it off. This dress I couldn't afford and they think they're really saying something beyond F you and I'll kill you. I don't feel you got caught stealing no hands. I'm hot, no fans. But at the stake of all your demands, guess my presence never been felt because you got the mark of your father's belt. 666, sick, silent suffering. Whenever you dead in a ditch, I feel like a million missing. I feel like no one's listening. All locked in the kitchen, a million bitching. A million bitching, don't get snatched at night. Sex traffic hitchhike to the end of your life. I guess an AR may save your life in this American racist high life. So as I read it, this is about like the representations of women in hip hop, or there's a dress, and then the, the, the masculine figures in hip hop being very violent, saying F you and I'll kill you, and then that's all they're saying. And then you got the mark of your father's belt, 666, meaning that the cycles of abuse and trauma in African American households are being borne by the men in the family, and that they are then imposing that on the women who are sick, silent, suffering, a million missing, locked in the kitchen, a million bitching, so like these women who are stuck in a domestic role, sex traffic head, I guess an AR may save your life, an AR being a, being a machine gun, may end up, or semi-automatic weapon, whatever it is, it's that thing that kills everybody, that for some reason we like having around. An AR may save your life, the paradox in this American racist high life, so American racist becomes the AR, makes the AR-15 rifle, an American racist rifle, high life, essentially saying that like the life that's being portrayed here is the best thing that American racists would want. This kind of fractured family, this kind of systematic trauma, this kind of systematic sexism. Am I correct? I don't know. I'm actually scared to even release this interpretation. This might be a, a, a condescending, pandering, <laughs> statement, you know? That's all right. That's what it is, actually. People wonder what, what, uh, what it is to be an academic. Um, you know, when, when you publish papers and stuff, usually the people are dead, so you don't really have to worry about it. <laughs> but it's just sort of like, this is what I think, and this is why I think it. But I could be totally wrong. This song could actually be only about gun rights. I don't know. Or uh, maybe about, about gun control. I'm now going to go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker. My wife may be coming down at some point because there's a burek in the stove. Burek is Balkan soul food. It is some of the best food in the world. I'm going to go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker here. Opens up with the song Umzansi, which I believe is a Zulu adjacent tribe in Africa. Based on my research, I could be wrong. Google. I had to rely on Google a lot for this video. And we all know, even though Google is the smartest person in the world, we don't quite know. Uh, weird sort of echoing sounds in the back eventually starts to have some form. Really for an opening track, this announces this idea of this free jazz highway. <laughs> Quantum, black in the moment. These like high harp sounds. Turns out this is Mary Lattimore playing harp, which is great. You know, my daughter plays, well, used to play harp. Um, so Mary Lattimore is like the famous harpist. Words trailing off and sort of plowing through and echoing. Um, I dance to the trials of my father. And then we get to the song April 7th. This is what I'm talking about, that the apotheosis. <laughs> the apotheosis is when people like, like float off to heaven, you know? I had an apotheosis the third time I listened to this song, April 7th. These rolling drums, these, these just flying saxophone, gorgeous jazz, these like pulsing sounds underneath. Seriously, I don't know how she did it. I don't know how she put this all together in this song, but I can tell you the first time I listened to it, I was like, mm, skip, okay? I didn't listen to more than five seconds of it. This is some really good art here. And it was really that third listen that made me rise up. Like, I, like, I'm being cheesy, but what the hell? You're watching this video, you're 24 minutes into this video. So, and you know how long this video is. I don't know how long this video is, so I don't edit these things either. <laughs> so you, you can tell me in the comments. I like when people tell me in the comments how long these videos are, because I don't know. So I did some research, and I think April 7th is a reference to Billie Holiday's birthday. Thank you. Thank you, more mother. I've spent a couple days with this album. I now will always remember that April 7th is Billie Holiday's birthday. Let's celebrate April 7th, not April 20th. 
you potheads who are also celebrating Adolf Hitler's birthday. <laughs> All right, let's celebrate April 7th. Some beautiful lines about Billie Holiday. I assume it's so much more than the drugs and more powerful than the drugs. Um, and then leads into the song Golden Lady, which feels like it's connected because the singing is kind of like there's some jazz singing going on here. I assume it's by this person, Melanie Charles, not by More Mother herself. There's so many collaborators on this album, I can't figure out when More Mother is doing something. But that's another reason I always had problems with jazz is I never understood who was doing what when. Like when you like put on like a, a an album and you're like, this is a Duke Ellington album. And like, what's Duke Ellington doing? He's nothing. Did he write the song? Is he performing it? He's band leading? I, what does this mean? Uh, to a certain extent, More Mother's doing a lot of here. I don't know exactly what she's doing here, but this really does feel like this is about the power of Billie Holiday's music and by extension, the power of more mother's music and by extension the power of all this great african-american music which is often forgotten for reasons which we will talk about soon i let a song go out in my heart it's magic straight ahead and here's the thing i don't like people talking about the magic of music okay it's cheesy i don't like people talking about the mystical properties of music okay but do you remember the me from five minutes ago who was trying to describe april 7th and said i felt as though i was being dragged up to heaven <laughs> so I got nothing. I got nothing. This album has defeated me. And there's nothing better than being defeated by a good album. Joe McAfee, Nation Time Intro, has this preaching thing by another jazz musician named Joe McAfee. Never heard of him. I'll have to look him up. Uh, there's a place in Rochester, New York called The Bop Shop, which is a, a very good... I usually go to the Record Archive in Rochester, which is a, a great record store for like rock and roll and stuff. Uh, but The Bop Shop is like this great jazz place. So I'm actually going to go in the next couple weeks. Follow me on Instagram. Yep, you'll see. I'm going to go and I'm going to track down some of these jazz albums. I'm going to find these artists. Because I don't know enough about every... About every five years, I decide I'm going to like learn more about jazz and I buy a couple albums. And it's been about five years. Racist fascists in our White House. Neo-Nazis in the streets. We got miles to go and promises to keep. Culture vultures in our bed. I just... It's, it's worth... It's worth reminding ourselves, Okay? It's actually worth reminding ourselves that we really did have racist fascists in the White House, okay? And I'm not just talking about Trump. I'm talking about people like Stephen Miller who are serving Trump, I'm talking like Bannon who is serving him, right? Like, it's so tired. We're so tired of talking about Trump and, oh, look at his hair and what, can you believe he said Kofefi and all that stuff. Um, it's very intellectual and very sort of distant if, if, if you're, you know, whiter than Tom Petty. But, like, uh, it's terrible, it's really, even though these, these lyrics are so on the on the nose, there were neo Nazis marching in the street with a fascist in the White House like five years ago. And then he keeps saying it's nation time. What does that mean? I looked it up. I looked it up by mistake. Later, a different song, like five songs from now, she mentions someone named Bakara, or is it Baraka? I don't even know. It's either Baraka or Bakara. I apologize, except to say my ignorance is profound. And this shows that. After finding endless uh, fact sheets about a famous Mortal Kombat character, it turns out this, this jazz guy named, I'll just call him Amiri, because I know his first name, had this amazing poem called It's Nation Time. And he was really for an idea of black nationalism which is not the same thing as black separatism. It is not just white nationalism, but black. Let's not get into that right now, but just be very clear that you understand that black nationalism and white nationalism are not the same thing, just different colors. <clears throat> and to say so is horribly racist. Moving on. So this idea of it's nation time, I, I believe is the sense of needing to build some sort of protection, some sort of safe place for people of color, in particular black people in America, and that's the sort of more militant side to this album. We then get to the song Ode to Mary, where she keeps on talking about her mother and about Mary and all these religious themes. So there you are, you're thinking, oh, it's like a religious thing, there's a lot of religion on this album, this must be a religious thing. Nope. It's another lesson. Professor Moore Mother gives us another assignment. She directly says, listening to Mary Lou Williams playing Scorpio. Go ahead, take a break from this video. I don't care, you'll come back or you won't, I don't care. You'll miss the part where I get interrupted. 
by my wife taking out the thing. You missed my stories about jazz music, but that's okay. You can leave, and you just go, and you type in the following words, Mary Lou Williams Scorpio. You will discover the first hit on YouTube, a, I believe it's a Smithsonian recording of Mary Lou Williams, the pianist, and the jazz composer of her song Scorpio, which she wrote for the Duke Ellington, and you'll hear her play the song with a trio. And it is as good as jazz music ever is. And by the way, I'd never heard of Mary Lou Williams. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know she existed. I never heard of this song. I never heard of Zodiac. I never heard of anything. Nothing. Total ignoramus. Insanely good song kind of plunky, almost like bolero style rhythms. It develops really nicely, it goes kind of minor at times. And then and so then I listened to the song and then I went back to Ode to Mary and it makes very much sense with the way the piano is playing in the background. It feels like it's a response, a, a conversation with, an intertextual conversation between more mother and Mary who is basically serving as her sort of spiritual mother. She keeps on saying the words free spirits, which look that up as well, and you'll find out that's the name of an album by Mary Lou Williams, which I cannot find online for cheaper than $70. So I might end up having to go to that Bob shop and ask them if they have it. I'll, I'll pay Bob shop 70 bucks for it. We'll see, my Patreons are good to me. Eventually some bass appears a little bit more regularly, some, some structure, but not too much. And then in the end, we have this whole thing where we have a boogie-woogie piano playing in the way back with someone describing something. And that's Mary Lou Williams herself talking about how she retired from music to pray. <laughs> and this boogie-woogie piano that's in the background is so funny because at this point, I'm, 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 I'm looking so much for structure. I've been in like free jazz land that I'm like, oh, boogie doo 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 boogie doo 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 I'm so comfortable. And then we move on to the next song, Woody Shaw. Woody Shaw... Professor Moore tells us that this is, Professor Mother, um, that this is another jazz flugelhornist. Flugelhornist. Woody Shaw. And so it's another reference, another album I'm going to have to track down, kind of a sleepy jazz singing. This is sort of like the most comprehend, like most sort of together song in the beginning. Um, tinkling synthesizers as well, kind of a clavichord style. And then here we get to this question of Baraka. This is where Baraka is mentioned. Baraka time codes upside the head of an Eastman score. So this album is so dense that I only picked up, I only thought to look up Amiri Bakara, I mean Baraka, because of this line, because I thought maybe she's referring to the Eastman School of Music. I mean, she's sitting here and this, this album is filled with some of the greatest musicians in the world, and the Eastman School of Music is the greatest or the second greatest school of music in our country. So maybe that's kind of like this funny idea of like Baraka, Amiri Baraka, doing interesting time codes and different things, upside an Eastman score, like upending the musical school. And I love the sort of layering with this almost like glitchy synthesizer layering in the back. Next song is called Meditation Rag. Uh, she says good night jazz in a way that I think is supposed to be like good night moon, the children's book. You know, my wife is super pregnant. She, she's about to be more mother. Um, and, uh, and she, you know, she's not from America. She's from Serbia, uh, Yugoslavia and then Serbia. Um, but like, so like she's never even heard of good night moon. I have to like explain like the very hungry caterpillar and good night moon. So it's very funny. Like of all the things that I love about the United States of America, you know, there's a lot of things that are good about our country. Our love of the book Good Night Moon is way high at the top. That is a, that book just rules. <laughs> it's, talk about free jazz. It's just like Good Night Socks, Good Night Box, you know? No, that's not, that's not in the book. I, have to, I better get used to it. And this ends up being sort of another jazz, another jazz lesson. Fortunately, here he's talking about people I do own. Dizzy Gillespie albums, you know, Dripping Dizzy, Wet Coltrane. I do own some John Coltrane. I actually went to John Coltrane's house in Philadelphia where he lived. Bridgewater Blue Miles, Ragtime Rag, <clears throat> Maple, Leaf, Maple Leaf Rag, Original Rag, Mississippi Rag, Too Much Jelly Roll, Too Much Memphis Blues, Bolden, Armstrong, Cakewalk. Oh. So what I like about this is that it's like this jazz lesson, but then there's just like operatic singing in the background. Like, woo woo and it's not like Yoko, it's like actual operatic singing. Next song is called So Sweet Amina. <clears throat> uh, Google, Google is the smartest person in the world. I asked him, 
who is, um, I, I typed in Amina Jazz, and I got the name Amina, ja Amina Scott Jazz Bassist. Maybe that's who she's talking about. Maybe it's not. Maybe we're not supposed to know. It's all right, it's all blood, hold tight, hold your wives. I don't get these lyrics, but they're poetic and they're evocative, random sort of jazz vocalizing in the back, stuttered guitars coming in. There's so much happening right here. I, I first listened to the song, uh, my son was gonna go hang out with his friends in the village. And uh, so we, I walked him down to the village and I walked back on my own. I listened to this album and it was a summer night. And I'm like listening to this song and I have all these guitars and it's like improvising bass and the saxophone and drums almost form. And then I have all these summer sounds of the cicadas in the ears and the wind. And it's just a very agreeable uh, listening experience. It ends with a story of someone talking about playing, having church. Again, this, this concept of church and music is very connected all the way throughout the album. Dust together has these nice bells and bass and saxophone. The bass is actually fairly regular. Um, some of the most clear song structure on the album, the least free, but then it gets this great horn in the background all about sort of spirituality. Rap Jasm, on any other album, uh, this would be the least structured song, but on this one, it's one of the more structured. A stuttering beat, she's actually rapping here. This is nice, like, I think it's more interesting to have spoken word poets who also rap and rappers who also do spoken word poetry. I, 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 I don't, because often what happens is that like, people who do one put down the other, and that's just reductive and silly. So, I like this very much. I like hearing her actual rap. I like her actual voice. She has a good timber to her voice. Um, and then there's this sort of like, it ties in and makes a reference to uh, the outcast, you know, Miss Jackson, forever, forever, ever. Great kind of sparse organ sounds in the back. Um, there's like an actual chorus. Like, it can go any way, but it's going down. It actually sounds kind of like a badass rap song. And then a guy named Akai Mel comes in and has good interaction. Like, it's nice having a male voice on here as well. And I like how he ends his verse just going, sheesh. <laughs> I don't know. It's almost like a Napoleon Dynamite ending. Like, gosh. <laughs> Blues Away featuring Fatboy Sharif is insane. I love this song. Someone's just yelling in the back, just screaming with abandon. Like this. Okay, so I... Okay. I don't know how more mother works. I don't. Even, I've never even seen a picture of her, so I don't know what she looks like. But I picture her sometimes, like Duke Ellington, like wearing like the full tuxedo with the tails and like a top hat. Um, and he might have wore a top hat, maybe not. But like, just sort of like, like being a conductor and like putting all. But but then what a lot of people are doing is just kind of crazy free jazz stuff, right? So so it's sort of like I sort of imagine that, and then I imagine sort of like something much more sort of transcendental and freaky, right? But this song, like, like it's like a love song. You took the blues away from me. Like the idea of a love song being in the negative, like you took something away. You took away my ability to be sad. My drums no longer swing. Uh, these great repeated lyrics, just a great vibe. And just all of the screaming in the background. It's awesome. I've never heard uncontrolled screaming employed so efficiently, so consistently throughout a song. And it really has an emotional honesty to it that I really enjoy, this idea of taking away the blues. Next song is called Blame. Has a nice gentle organ, slightly confrontational rap style. They tried to throw me away, said I ain't struggled enough, said I ain't fragile enough. I only want one in me, said I ain't got none in me. Don't look, cause the clip's not empty. Uh, bless, anime Bullock famous. It's a very short song. Um, anime Bullock. Do you know who that is? This is what I want you to do. If you know who Anime Bullock is without me having to tell you, please put in the comments, I am a smarty. Because you're a smarty. I didn't know. That's Tina Turner's original name. I didn't know that. I don't know how Anime becomes Tina. I know how Bullock became Turner, because she was married to Ike Turner, one of the most important guitarists in the history of the world, and an abusive monster. Um... So this sort of seems to be going back to that theme of the arms save song of sort of like the position of black women in court in relationship to a more dominant black male cultural space, especially considering that arms save is the next song. So it feels like this might be headed towards a sort of militant black female reaction to accepted brutality 
from men in those spaces? Or I'm misreading. I'm a language professor, right? And one of the most amazing things is when people read a book in another language and they don't know what the word means. <laughs> and they just keep reading, and then their entire concept, it's like when you make a mistake in math and, and you carry the mistake all the way through to the end. Like I remember I was reading a book by André Malraux, uh, I think it was La Condition Humaine, and it, it was all about, um, all about these people who are in the jungle in South America. And the term for, uh, for uh, binoculars is jumel, which means twins. But I didn't know it meant binoculars. So I thought this guy was walking around with twins. Like he just kept on talking about twins. So like when I was thinking about this book, I was imagining this dude in the jungle constantly with his twins. So I might be misreading this whole thing. It might be it's about something else. If you have an idea of what it means, you can also tell me that in the comments. If you have an idea of anything, because my comment sections are the best comment sections on YouTube, I believe. I believe. Very little trolling, very little nastiness. And a lot of things that I like is that people come in and they just plow in paragraphs upon paragraphs upon paragraphs. Go ahead. Seriously, go ahead. I read everything. I don't comment on everything because apparently that makes me look needy, but I read everything. <laughs> I love it when people really give me their thoughts on music. You know, that hopefully, hopefully my videos and their comment section can be a little repository of thought when people go back and they look at this really great album. So then we get Arm Save, then we get Real Trill Hours featuring Young Morpheus, um, doubled voice, hyper pop, the beat kind of trails in. Uh, sort of about wealth inequality, billions for space travel, pennies for the poor. It might be sort of a callback to Gil Scott Heron, Whitey's on the Moon. Uh, I really do like the male voice on here. Next song is called uh, Evening, setting up a verse as she's describing like what she's doing. She calls out Miles Davis again. It almost becomes pop at this point. I just want to live another day so I can live another day. It's pop because, like... <laughs> The rest of the album is so free. Uh, references, I'm just like Billy, you know, I assume like that. Um, and then she keeps on using the terms cool like that. And so I think, I think this might be in conversation with the Diggable Planet song, Cool Like That, that was a, a pretty big hit in, I think it was the early to mid 90s. Bam, 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 bam. I bought the album, by the way. I, I normally would show it to you, but someone stole it. <laughs> I, I had a great CD collection, but my friends, I had a lot of people over in my, in my school, I mean, in my home, and they would just like, I know, just like my house was like the house where people would come over to hang out. The only rule was if you did drugs or smoked or drank, you couldn't come to my house. So I had, I had, a, I had a good group of people around me, but someone stole my Diggable Planet CD. Next song is called Barely Woke. Odd, glitchy sounds. This song's out of nowhere. It's like, like these beeps from an 808, and then like a jungle beat, like the actual Amen break sped up. And it's great. It's like total break from the rest of the album. This is what I'm talking about, like free rap is not the same thing as free jazz because if you're doing free rap, you can just break into another genre and do what you want. Uh, nice kind of angry growl here from More Mother. Then we get the song Noise Jism, which is jism of noise. <laughs> That's all it is. Uh, Thomas Stanley, Jazz Codes outro. This is fascinating. So Thomas Stanley is another, I believe another jazz musician free jazz in the background, like these blaring droning sounds. And he talks about the relationship, like, like it's a very good essay on why jazz is no longer popular. And it puts forth the idea that capitalism is too strong and that's why jazz can't live because jazz, it doesn't work well with capitalism in its form and, and music that is more in line with capitalism, like hip hop, like rock and roll, like techno, like pop, like J-pop, like just about any other form of music <laughs> doesn't work as well with capitalism. <clears throat> so it ends with this interesting question about the nature of jazz. So there's my review of the album. It's great, it's transcendent. At times, it is in a good way. And I'm just going to close. It, you can come down if you need to get the Bordek. I'm just, I'm doing my uh, outro thing, so I will be talking, but it's okay. Don't, don't burn the Bordek. So I just talked a little bit about, about the oppression of the word jazz. So like I said, like, I feel like I understand funk, and, and I get it. You know, I'm just a white guy from suburban Massachusetts, so like, I shouldn't understand funk and soul, but I feel like I do. 
you know? Like I said, like this food I'm, like that she's making is is soul food. It's from the Balkans, so it's not soul in the in the African American sense of it. But like I feel like I understand soul, and, and to a certain extent I understand funk. But jazz was a totally different four letter word I didn't understand. In particular, it's tied into this weird figure in my life named Bob Stewart, who was like an amazing figure. He was like a friend of my family, and he loved jazz. And he would always come over and look at my CD collection, and he, he would just, just. Just say how bad it was. And this is, Diggable Planets might have been in there, but he would just look at it, and I mean, basically, <laughs> your, your record collection is really meat and potatoes. Oh, thanks. You know, like, I remember once he read a review of a, of a compilation of Charles Mingus, and he just told me, he chain smoked, died of lung cancer, sad story. Sky, uh, you need to buy this album right now. So I went out and I bought 13 pictures, and to his credit, I loved this compilation of Charles Mingus, in particular Haitian Fight Song, which is one of my favorite songs. The one song I didn't like was Picanthropus Erectus, which, guess what, is considered free jazz, so I didn't quite get it. You know, but like, his sort of cool elitism was mixed in with the sense that I'd never get it. Plus, my dentist always listened to jazz, and it was the only time I ever heard jazz was when I was getting tooth work. And then, like, there was this whole sense that every time people would say jazz, they'd say it like this. Jazz. Like, it was something so cool. Like, I would never get. Like, freshman year of college, there was this kid, Eric, who played bass. And I remember, because, like, all the girls on the hall liked him, and I was lonely and felt like a loser. And I was always so mad, because part of what they liked about him was he really liked jazz. My interactions with jazz were so bizarre that I actually took drum lessons from Alan Dawson, who is one of the great jazz drummers of all time. Like, he played with Dave Brubeck, he had his own thing. Like, tr like truly the most amazing drumming I've ever seen in person was when I saw Alan Dawson play. I took two lessons with him, and he fired me, because I wouldn't practice. He was trying to teach me uh, to take the A train on drums, and I just wanted to do his thing. I just didn't get it. But fortunately, fortunately I was saved. My daughter demanded that I get into jazz music. She loves Billie Eilish. I mean, Billie Holiday. She loves Billie Eilish too. But she loves Billie Holiday. And she loves all sorts of jazz singing. My son learned how to play a lot of great jazz drumming. And we listened to jazz drumming together. And I realized jazz is so old now. We can be free. Okay? We don't have to feel like it's some oppressive thing that we don't understand. I still don't get bitches brew. I'm trying. I'm trying, but it's okay. It doesn't make me ignorant. It doesn't make me an idiot. That feeling of like the gatekeeping, all those gatekeepers, they're passing on. They're moving on. We can just interact with jazz and enjoy it. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the bop shop and pick up Mary Lou Williams, okay? I'm gonna go pick up a Mary Lou Williams thing and I'm just gonna put it on and I'm just gonna enjoy it. Just like I enjoy more mother. Okay, there you go. Until next time, oh. Oh yeah, so the, my Patreons love this album and I told them if they wanted me to, I would give them a shout out, um, but no one responded, but I only gave them a couple hours. So, you can look in the comments. One of these people might get a special shout out as being a super big more mother fan who wanted to be mentioned right now but uh, didn't check their email early enough. Okay. Till next time, there's the jazz.